Morning and welcome to the Coaching Models of Supervision for Midwifery Learners webinar. Um, I can hear lots of people still joining. My name's Ricky Hurley and I'm the Midwifery Workforce Lead for the North Eastern Yorkshire working for NHS England. It's great to see so many of you still joining us here today. It's freezing cold in Doncaster. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to be here this morning. We are recording the webinar today and we'll also share any slides and videos we use. We will stop recording when we get to the interactive Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, we want you to feel comfortable to ask any questions at that point. We will be muting you all until we get to the interactive Q&A so we can hear all the presentations and speakers. But we do want today to be interactive. And we want to encourage you to put any comments and questions in the chat box as we go along. We're hoping that most of your questions will be addressed um, during the webinar, but we'll do our best to answer any remaining queries in the interactive Q&A at the end. Um, this webinar is truly collaborative with regional and national colleagues working together to plan and deliver what we hope will be an exciting agenda. If my colleague Paul can share the agenda now, hopefully you received it when we sent it out yesterday and I'll briefly go through the agenda before passing to my colleague. Thank you, Paul. Great, as you can see, we have Lisa Jessen up shortly, setting the scene around the coaching approach. Then we have some videos from our midwifery learners. We've got Jackie Williams, looking at the coaching approach and how the NMC and SSSA supports um, coaching in midwifery. We've got Juliet and Carol looking at the introduction to coaching models. Then we've got a panel of experts. And then finally, we've got the interactive Q&A. So at this point, I would like to um, pass on to my colleague, Caroline Carey, who will introduce herself. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much, Ricky, for allowing me to collaborate in this. It's going to be wonderful. Um, so my name is Caroline Carey and I am the project lead for a project called Supporting Learners Innovatively with Coaching or SLIC. Um, and my project is working towards the introduction of a coaching approach in four different trusts down in the southeast. Um, so that's what I'm here to do. Um, is Lisa here? I'm going to. Yes, she is. I see her. So, Lisa, I'm going to hand over to to you to set the scene from a national perspective. Great. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen with a very short um, set of slides um, to take you through the national perspective um, to just set the scene really at the start of, of this um, webinar. Um, so as you can see from that slide, I'm Lisa Jessen and I'm the deputy lead midwife. And um, I work with Kerry Eilertz and Feeney, who's the lead midwife within workforce training and education at NHS England. Um, we both joined Health Education England in the summer of 2022. And this part of work is part of, of our sort of ambition for quality improvement. So I'm just going to take you through that to help to set the scene. So um, this part of the webinar um, will just really set the scene and provide you with the background to the project that focuses on coaching models in midwifery and the neonatal setting. So what you can see here is a rather busy slide at first glance. Um, I wanted to share this with you because it really shows you where coaching fits in. Um, we're currently undertaking three phases of workforce training and education quality improvement projects. The first phase, phase one, is the development of the Safe Learning Environment Charter. Um, that piece of work started um, in the autumn of 2022 and we're just at the point where we're awaiting publication of the Charter. 
that charter is really focusing on setting the right circumstances um, for students to be able to achieve their best and optimise their placement experiences by providing a set of solutions and priorities um, that can be implemented within clinical practice to foster a positive culture, a psychologically safe culture and foster the best learning environment for students. And it's a multi-professional charter that really started with the midwifery learners to inform the development of that. Phase two is around a piece of work that's going to help embed the standards for student supervision and assessment in midwifery and neonatal settings. Um, what we've realised is that there are differences in terms of the training and preparation of practice supervisors, practice assessors and academic assessors. And this piece of work is going to create a set of key principles um, to form a framework to help support equity and raise the standards of quality of supervision. The third phase and the one that we're focusing on today is around coaching models to support learners in clinical practice across midwifery and neonatal settings. Um, it's for informed by a scoping and evaluation that will lead to the creation of a framework and toolkit. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that now. So why is this work important? Um, this project really supports both the train and retain priorities in the long term workforce plan. Let me just get to the right slide. Bear with me, my slides are playing up a little bit today. So um, there are several important reforms will the several important reforms will need to accompany expansion to improve the experience of learners and ensure um, clinicians of the future have the skills they need to provide high quality care. The long term workforce plan also states that we need to consider how education capacity should be developed in key service areas, including the support re required to provide high quality education, such as supervision and clinical placements and that reform to adopt innovative and accessible modes of tuition and supervision are also required. So really a coaching model really helps to address those priorities of the long term workforce plan. Um, the project is also referred to in the three year delivery plan for maternity and neonatal services, specifically under objective five as one of the three essential projects required to improve the learner experience. And within that plan, it states that NHS England will develop a safe clinical learning environment, Charter for Trust, which is phase one, develop models for coaching, which is phase three, and embed the framework to support the triple SI, which is phase two. These initiatives will really help together to ensure that high quality clinical placements are in place for those people training to become midwives. So from a strategic perspective, coaching absolutely and this project absolutely fulfils parts of those requirements of the long term workforce plan and the three year delivery plan. So phase three. Um, specifically around coaching, has some aims and objectives. So this work really aims um, to improve the clinical placement experience for midwifery students across both maternity and neonatal services. And it will do that by providing the information needed by any maternity or neonatal service, no matter the size or geography, to adopt a coaching model of supervision. This work will take all the learning and scoping that we've had from the development of the Safe Learning Environment Charter and what we're gathering from the work done on phase two to embed triple SA in midwifery um, to build the evidence base and ensure alignment. The objective of this project is to develop a framework and toolkit detailing a national approach to coaching to support pre-registration midwifery education and to support neonatal and midwifery settings to implement and embed a coaching model. And I'm really excited that we're sort of journeying along that path now and starting to think about what that looks like. I'm very excited to um, think forward to when that's going to be published and released out to the service. 
So that's it from me, just to sort of set the scene um, and to thank you. And I'll stay on this call and happy to respond to the discussions and any questions at the end. Um, I'll hand back over um, to Caroline and um, Ricky. Thanks so much, Lisa. That was great. A great start to the webinar. Thank you so much for setting the scene and I'll pass over to Caroline. OK, so Paul now is going to share some videos where um, we've got some recording from feedback from some of the midwifery learners who have actually experienced working with coaching and collaborative learning. Um, so we're going to to hear straight from the horse's mouth, as they say. So, Paul, if you wouldn't mind just sharing those videos. Working with and on the students really made you, I don't know, think about how you're teaching them as well. Especially when I had a first year, their first ever placement, I it made me explain a lot more and also make me brush up on what I needed to work on. Um, and I also felt that actually it was a really good video for me to realise how far I have come, like how much I actually know. Um, because sometimes you know when you come to a third year, you feel like, oh, will I be able to do this on my own? And actually, it really did make me realise how much I have learned in the last few years mm -hmm. whilst I was teaching in the first years. Yeah, and like, even working on the second year, um, at the moment I'm working with someone who's a senior second year, and I don't know, like getting that feedback from them saying like they they feel like confident with us explaining things and like they're still learning from us even though like I feel like I'm still learning sometimes and I feel like they, they give us our, like good feedback as well as our um, as our Supervisors. Hi, uh, my name is Audrey. I'm a first year student midwife. I've really enjoyed working in the clip model because you've got a, a third year student to explain things to you, and they explain things in often like simple terms because they're students as well, so they know how we would understand understand things. And you've just got an extra person to get knowledge from. You've got the midwife and the student. That's great. Thanks so much for sharing the videos, Paul. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I'd now like to introduce Jackie um, Williams. Um, Jackie, do you want to introduce yourself and I'll start some questions? Morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jackie Williams, Senior Midwifery Advisor at the Nursing and Midwifery Council. Lovely. Thanks so much, Jackie. I'm delighted to be here. It's great to have you, Jackie. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I wonder if I may um, pose a few questions to you around um, the coaching approach. So um, firstly, what is the NMC's views on coaching? So I think, Ricky, it's important to say that we wouldn't specify an absolute approach to supervision because we have some more high level principles. But when these new standards came in, they definitely were with the intention that supervision of students could be much more uh, flexible, could involve others. And of course, that then leads to sort of a different approaches, really. I mean, whatever model is used, the principles of standards of supervision of assessment apply. I think that's really important. Um, so we want to know that that practice supervision is ensuring safe and effective learning experiences. There is there's sufficient coordination, continuity of that support. And um, there's there's really oversight of that that approach to ensure that the learning is both safe and effective. Lovely. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, and then where do you think coaching would work well in midwifery? OK, so I think people have often said, oh, well, it doesn't work in midwifery because it's different. You know, the, the arrangements are different placement settings. I can see it absolutely working very much aligned perhaps to nursing approaches in the postnatal ward. Um, because um, you've got the the setup in that environment, which enables that um, that supervision to continue 
uh, albeit in a different way. And of course, you have got different learners usually um, allocated to that environment. But I think it does have um, it does prevent present an opportunity in other areas as well. But I think what you said right at the beginning, Ricky, was really important that this isn't just a fixed model. This is an approach. Um, so this is something about engaging with the students, getting them to problem solve, as opposed to perhaps that direct teaching, which you you may or may not adopt when you 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 adopt a, a more traditional supervision model. So for delivery suite, I think it would work very well, but not with a group. But the but the practice supervisor who is allocated to that student to provide one to one care to that woman, because you don't want more than one student really with the woman, because obviously we restrict her birth partners and she should be able to have more birth partners rather than more students, if you like. Mm -hmm. But it works would work so well for the more senior students, particularly the third years. And picking up on what something that student was saying was about giving confidence. And I think that is so important in the delivery suite environment where you, the supervisors are stepping back a little bit when it's appropriate and then adopting that coaching approach if you, in order for them, the students to begin to plan the care, assess the care, evaluate the care and obviously conduct the care. And of course, that's really good confidence building because we know that many that is the area that um, student midwives and newly qualified midwives are the most concerned about. So adopting a different approach as they become more senior and confident, it, it benefits all around. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that that supervisor is going off and doing other things. They're absolutely not because they're still responsible for that woman. But it's the approach they adopt, if you like, Ricky. Yep. That's great. And I think that's a question that would would have come up, actually, um, Jackie, for a lot of people. So thank you for that answer. Um, the, sorry, the other the other yeah. the other way I think it could work very well um, is, you know, in a clinic environment. But I think mm -hmm. the, the it, it, there's probably more um, barriers because of the structure of the way maybe clinics are run. So if, they, if say, for example, a community midwife had the luxury of several rooms then it and with different students then that could also work but I could that's possibly a little bit more challenging but it but not impossible so mm. I think and I think in the postnatal space as well when when students are perhaps going out a bit more independent visiting so I think it, I wouldn't want to exclude it from the community but it probably needs a little bit more thinking through like loan working how you're going to have that contact have you got the resources you know to support that mm -hmm. that's great thanks so much for that yep um and if a, a reminder if anyone wants to put any questions or queries or comments in the chat that would be great um and then what do you think are the positive effects of coaching i think you've you've hinted at that already jackie well i um, have and i think it is this confidence now i think we're in a really interesting situation that students now are going to be have the development to become supervisors at the point of registration but and i've heard this actually from students themselves they are nervous about doing that but those students mm. on those videos were talking about how great it was that they would have that confidence to teach others how they began to really think about what they know and, and recognize what they know so um i think we are we built? I suppose this is a, a rhetorical question for everybody to think about. Are we building up barriers for the newly qualified midwives, almost implying that they're not ready or confident to take on these roles by um, perhaps, you know, preventing them, in inverted mm -hmm. commas, from doing certain things? Now, I'm not suggesting they wouldn't have support. You know, they would absolutely need probably a buddy in a supervisor. Um, and there's some students that might need a little bit, you know, newly qualified might need a little bit longer. But I think we've got to recognise that this this coaching model could challenge us a little bit into the newly qualified space in terms of what we're doing. And of course, that would help the situation with how many supervisors there are for the students. 
-hmm. So just yeah. a question to be posed, because we say that they can supervise students at the point of registration. Yep, absolutely, yeah. Um, and I think one question that will definitely come up will be around the challenges. So what do you think might be the challenges of coaching for midwifery? Well, I think thinking about how other healthcare professionals um, and our other multi-agency team come into this, because obviously the standards support students being supervised by other healthcare professionals. So I think that's something to think through. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very anxious about continuity in terms of students telling me that they're going into placement settings and they're not getting any continuity whatsoever with practice supervisors. And they're, they're citing numbers like 38 um, super, different supervisors within a, within a six-week placement, which seems incredible. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we've got to, even if you're using a traditional model of supervision, we've got to move to a much more continuity model where, stu yes, students benefit from different supervisors, but to turn up on the day and then be allocated a supervisor, students are telling us are not helpful. Now, this, this, mod this way of approach, of course, offers an opportunity, doesn't it, to, to mm -hmm. provide even more continuity because the practice supervisor will be overseeing more students. I think supervisors will need that support as to how to do that because they are more used to a sort of, oh, that's one to one type supervision. But it's not impossible. But I think, you know, I'm also hearing from supervisors how they're exhausted. They're constantly mm -hmm. having students and even even ones who are absolutely passionate. And we know there's people who are still not very passionate about uh, supervising students for all different reasons. But we're very clear that everybody can supervise. We do need to think about giving some breaks for those supervisors to refresh, gain their own professional development. Mm -hmm. So sort of quite a sort of a mixture of things. But I think this is this is an opportunity, but it is not necessarily a replacement because mm -hmm. there will be still times when things are done maybe in a perhaps more um, um And I think the other challenge might be that students need to um, be supported to be confident in what they're doing mm, you know yes um, and know who they can refer to if they've got doubts or concerns and uh, and the confidence to actually say well I don't actually know that but we will go and find out together yep yep definitely yep um, that's great. Thank you. And we will look at challenges later on in the panel discussion, but that's really great. And then looking at the future, um, we've been working well together, lots of collaboration. So how will the NMC support future plans and progress around coaching? Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, it's a it's within the standards, not not named per se. But obviously, if it meets the standards, then there are different ways to approach supervision of students, aren't they? Mm -hmm. um, I think we've still got, and Lisa highlighted it, this, we've still got um, an issue about embedding the standards of supervision. So in a way, if that work can be done side by side, that is important. It's not going away. Mm -hmm. And if you, know, if you hear midwives saying, well, I don't like it, well, it is the standards and we're not going back to it. We changed it for very, very good reasons in terms of getting that objectivity between a, a supervision and assessment. But we do need to make sure that is properly embedded before, mm -hmm. in a way, another, what they will see is, oh, this is something different. This is a change. It isn't a change. It's really all part and parcel of what the standards are saying. But I, I think we do need to really think about how this is going to be embedded and adopted so that supervisors are supported to work in a slightly different way. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much, Jackie. Um, I think just in amongst those questions and answers, I think a lot of people's queries will hopefully have been answered. But thank you so much for that. And I will now... Thank you. I will now go on to introduce um, Juliet Bowell and um, Carol Yearley. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ricky. It's lovely to be here today. Um, so my name is Juliet Bowell. I um, 
um, acting as an advisor to um, Lisa Carey Danielle on the, the national team for um, implementation of coaching coaching models um, as applied to practice learning settings um, and then my my other half in um, mm -hmm. in this quest is is the lovely Carol hello everybody good morning I'm Carol Yearly I'm Carol Yearly and I've had the pleasure of working um, with NHS England on this project and uh, with Juliet um, like Juliet I'm an advisor um, for the phase Three of this coaching project. Um, by background, I'm a midwife and I've worked in midwifery education for quite a long time and have worked in practice in various places for a long time. So it's very nice to see you all this morning. Um, Juliet and I are going to do um, a double act. We seem to do this quite a bit, actually. So we've got a few slides. Um, we hope it will be interactive as well. I'm going to um, start the session. Um, but what we'll be covering is that we'll be talking about coaching as an approach to learning in practice and, and building on some of the things we've already heard. Um, I, I did notice one of the students, Audrey, mentioned um, she was working within the CLIP model. Um, she specifically mentioned um, a coach, the name of a coaching model, um, which um, is in place and working very well where she is. But the, for the purposes of this, the mechanics and the structure of how the approach is formed into various models will be considered later during the panel discussion so if you've got you know questions about that that can be explored later but um for the purposes of this we'll be focusing mainly on um using coaching in a practice learning environment we've heard from jackie how the triple sa supports a learning uh, a coach an approach to um, coaching in, in practice. And Juliet and I will build on this to illustrate how this coaching approach combines with the Triple SA to create improvements in the practice learning experience. So, as I said, I'll start the presentation and then Juliet will take over after the first few slides. So, Paul, could we um, have the presentation showing, please? <clears throat> Thank you. And um, that's the first slide. Right. OK, that's lovely. Thank you, Paul. So a little um, start off with a trip down memory lane for you all. I'd like you to think back to when you were a student in practice. Now, for some people, that's not going to be very long ago. For others like me, it will be a long, long time ago in the last century, actually. <laughs> um, so think back to when you were a, a student in practice. And um, if you could recall, use the um, raise your hand button to, to um, show if, as a student, you remember working in a one-to-one -one model where you were allocated to work with one mentor. That's a former term that we <laughs> moved away from. Um, and if you were working with that one person for the whole shift and he or she told you what to do. OK, I'm going to ask the chair, Ricky, I can see 20 hands up. I'm yes, assuming yeah, the numbers so. are going up, up yeah. and up and up. Now, how many people have we got on this call? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm thinking that is the majority, isn't it? Um, so as expected, most hands have been raised, which suggests that a one to one um, model has been the dominant supervision model for the past 40 years or more, with no evidence base to support its use, which is quite interesting. So sometimes we do things because we think it's right. And maybe we think, forget that there might be another another way which might be better or different. And <clears throat> for us working on this project, that new way became a, a, a real opportunity with the implementation of the new midwifery standards because we were no longer uh, required to work with one practice supervisor for 40% of the time. So there was a freeing up. 
Let's 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 move to the next slide. So there was a freeing up of an opportunity to work with um, different practitioners uh, and in a different way. So why does this approach matter? So if we look on the right hand column, uh, which is headed mentoring and teaching, perhaps when you think about your own experiences, you can remember working with somebody who um, stepped in and provided care and you you um, followed her around in practice, um, th th you watched what your mentor was doing, your mentor um, directed your learning, allocated work, and um, you did the same work as before, but with the student. Um, individual opportunities were identified and the mentor played a very central role in that learning as, a, as an expert source of knowledge and, and in some cases uh, a figure of authority. If we perhaps move towards the left hand side and a coaching approach, the focus changes where the coach or the practice supervisor asks questions of the students steps back and allows the students to learn by providing care. And we did hear that from the, the two students who were talking in the clip. Um, the practice supervisor watches the student and the student demonstrates what they've learned to the coach. There's a very uh, questioning approach all the time, um, whereby the coach will listen um, to what the student's saying. So the work changes um, while whilst coaching the student and the whole uh, practice environment becomes a learning environment. So essentially the coach acts as a guide and facilitator helping the individual to tap into their own potential and find solutions for themselves. Now I would say it's not a panacea for everything. It's worth noting that these distinctions between mentoring and coaching are not rigid nor are they mutually exclusive. There can be an overlap between teaching and coaching, especially in a clinical practical situation. For an example, um, in an emergency clinical situation, um, a good teacher or a good coach, practice supervisor might incorporate coaching techniques to encourage critical thinking and independent problem solving to their students. Now, you can do this when you have a dyad of students under your supervision, a trio of students, but you can also have it when you have one student under your supervision. The key thing is that you are supervising um, those students. Similarly, the coach might draw on teaching methods to convey specific information or concepts relevant to the coaching process. And this is particularly the case when a student is learning and practicing um, a new skill so that the uh, practice supervisor or the coach needs to know the level of confident competence for each student so that he or she knows when to step in or to step back. So it's quite a fluid approach. Can we have the next slide, please, Paul? So I'm hoping this is going to work. This is a three minute clip about what coaching is. It features animals rather than people. And um, so think about it in the context of student learning and practice supervision and support. So if we could play that, please. got a back yeah have you got the backup paul yeah apologies that one more no it's Play fine one second i did have a, a slight issue when i tried another time but um hopefully the separate link will work
You got the link there, Paul. Yeah, just load in there. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Hey, can you help me? Hey, how can I help you? I need to cross over. You want to cross over the stream? Hmm. What have you tried so far? I tried to swim. I saw a fish doing that once. You tried being a fish? <laughs> what else? I tried to jump high. I saw a bird flying over the stream. You tried being a bird? What else? I saw a beaver once building a dike and thought that might work. You tried being a beaver? Hmm. Would you mind getting into the stream? What can you see? I don't know. Water? And my reflection? Excellent! And what do you see in that reflection? Is that a fish? No, it isn't. Is it a bird? No. Is it a beaver? It's not a beaver. So, what is it? It's a fox. So you're a fox trying to act like others. The others do easily what I want to do. So a fox can't do it. No, there must be a way. Can you see a solution here? Indeed I can. Then tell me. Be a fox, my friend. I am a fox. Then act like one. What would a fox do? <clears throat> I don't know. Foxes don't have a skill for crossing over streams. And what are your skills? Foxes are smart, observe and adapt. Ha! Oh, great! So, now, show me how you apply them. Wait! Look! The stream is decreasing! So what? If I wait two hours... Oh, thank you! You are a fox. Well done, my friend. Okay, <clears throat> so that's quite a nice little video which sums up some of the um, concepts about um, a coaching approach and it shows that coaching reveals potential and resourcefulness of learners. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Juliet now who's going to take this a little bit further. Thank you so much and thanks Juliet. Thank you, Carol. So for, for me, that video beautifully illustrates how coaching works with an individual. And each of our learners is exactly that, as uh, are the birthing people um, and every single one of us. We all come with our own experiences and quite often our own solutions as well. And it can be very tempting when we're all really, really busy to um, give what we see as really obvious solutions. But they're solutions that work for us. Um, so an example I give quite often, if I take off the pair of glasses that I'm wearing and give them to you, how, how helpful is that going to be? And so coaching really starts to unlock that individual's potential. And that's what helps to, to build the confidence. But we've also got some really clear guidance from the standards for student supervision and assessment, which is that the level of supervision can decrease with the students increasing proficiency and confidence. So how do we get to understand those levels of confidence? We get to understand that through those coaching uh, methodologies so that we get to hear what's going on in people's people's minds. And so when we combine a coaching approach with uh, a stage 
knowledge of a program that an individual is on with their life experiences as well. Go, okay, we, we want a, a bit of a dance going on, really, of the step in, the, the step back, and embracing the, the, the whole team around us to enable that to happen. And so there's some, some lovely guidance here to say, well, year, year one is about our learners participating and, and building confidence. And so th just have a think about how we might use a coaching approach in, in that regard. Well, what, pri what previous skills are you bringing to this? What is it that you would like to achieve first? You know, it might be that we've got somebody who wants to get a bit more experience with um, the, the technicalities of equipment before going live first. So actually, they would like to build their confidence in um, communication skills before we even get to the, um, the, the the task stage. So it's really understanding that individual and, and where they want to go to and how we can, can facilitate that as part of their learning journey towards joining the register. And quite often at this stage, yes, it's direct line of sight supervision, but you can still use a coaching approach to, to do this. Year two, it's starting to take that step back, both in terms of um, the, the level of, of supervision, but also in terms of the, of the coaching approach. OK, we can go deeper. We can we can do more. OK, and um, how are we enabling our learners to get closer to that point of care and, and, and acquire more skills? And then as, as Jackie was was saying earlier on in year three, that's where the, the full spectrum of coaching really comes to the fore. And through having experienced the approach, you will find by, by default, our learners are starting to filter that through their interactions with others and so really looking as to how that step in step back how that merges with a coaching approach which is tapping into individual solutions that change as the course of the the program goes on thank you paul could we have the the next slide please There's something that, that I encounter quite a bit is a bit of confusion with, well, how does coaching coaching model work with supernumerary status? So we thought it was worth um, just picking up on, on that during this presentation. And so, again, um, looking at, at the guidance that comes directly from, from the NMC, supernumerary status is not being counted as part of safe staffing. That's supernumerary status. Okay. But what our placements should absolutely be doing is enabling our students to learn to provide safe and effective care, not merely observe. Okay? Students can and absolutely should add real value to care. Okay? And as we're saying, that doesn't mean they're not being supervised. Okay? You are continuing to supervise, but how do we enable our, our learners to get a little bit closer? And as they're getting closer and we're building confidence, how can we take that step back? The contribution that our students make will increase over time as they gain their proficiency and they will continue to need, as we all do throughout our careers, ongoing guidance and feedback. Feedback's really important, properly constructive feedback on what you're doing well, it'd be even better if. And once a student has been able to demonstrate that they are proficient, they should be able to take more things on with less direct oversight. So taking taking a step back, letting the student take a step forward and building that further building that confidence that Jackie was referring to. And so if we could go on to the next slide, please. So it's giving some structure to a coaching approach. And so this is where a coaching approach might start to form some of the, the different models that are, that are out there. And it is a, putting some structure around, around the approach. And we were, we were hearing earlier that consistency is is um is really important so it's a bit of bit of structure around the, the supervision. And so to structure a coaching approach, it's not um, not something that's based purely on a one to one relationship. It's having that flexibility to adapt to the needs of the learner in the context of the environment. It's enabling our learners to deliver hands on care in a safe and effective way. It's also about enabling students to support each other's learning. And we were hearing in the videos um, earlier this morning how beneficial that can be and also helping 
meet the being practice supervisor ready at the point of registration. Providing structured opportunities for supervision and feedback. Now, what we're hearing from the structure um, wrapping around a coaching approach is as some supervisors are taking a, a step back, it's well, where do we get that, that structure for, for some conversations and build it in? Right? We can put some structure around it. It takes different, different formats, but having some structure really um, does help with um, formalizing an approach. What we have found is that you know individual learning needs need to be addressed mm -hmm. and, and met coming going forward and a coaching approach really helps do that so let's have a think how we can balance all these different aspects leadership for education executive sign up has proven to be really valuable in getting some structure around a coaching approach because it does feel unfamiliar at first mm -hmm. So how can we get some structure and some support around that? A sustainable infrastructure is one of the things that Carol and I hear about quite a bit. Coaching is, is part of a culture, it spreads. So part of the sustainability is the spread of a coaching approach. And the more that we have a critical mass of doing it, the more it becomes um, a, a flexible model in which we work. And then the, the other part of structure that is, is really useful to consider is how you link this to your organisational business. Mm -hmm. okay. The coaching approach, more confident practitioners coming through is really beneficial to uh, the organisations, to, to the mothers and to the, the babies. So um, I think our last slide, Paul, please, is, um, some links there that um, Carol and I certainly refer to an awful lot. You know, the, the Nurse and Midwifery Council have produced a huge range of resources to support uh, the triple SA and um, other factors that we, we grapple with. That there's a host of resources there that are really helpful. And so uh, we will send the slides around for you to have links to those as well. And we really would encourage you to um, go in and have a and have a good look. So um, that concludes the information from Carol and I. And thank you very much for having us. Thank you so much. Carol and Julia, that was really, really great. And I think we now, um, <clears throat> with lots of thumbs up coming through, um, now we go on to the panel discussion, I do believe. And back over to Carol and Juliet. <clears throat> OK, thank you. Um, Ricky, Juliet, can you, you just mute all? I can hear it. There's some there's just some interference in the background. If you if you've got the ability to do that, that'd be great. But keep. Carol, you need to come off mute now. And, uh, and also the uh, the panel, um, they know who they are. If they can unmute themselves, please, that'd be great. <laughs> OK, so thank you. Thank you, um, Juliet, for concluding that presentation. And we'll move on to the panel of experts discussion. Um, and I first of all, to start this session off, I'd like to thank all our lovely panel members for participating in the discussion for this webinar. You know, we know it's no mean feat to put yourself forward and we hope that you'll enjoy participating. We know the audience will love to hear from you because you might not think of yourselves as experts, but you are because you've lived and worked through coaching models in various in various ways. So um, this is an opportunity for us to hear and learn from you. Um, I, I think it would be nice if we just start by very briefly um, the panel members introducing themselves. So if you could just say what your name is and um, where you're working. I've got the uh, a list in front of me. So perhaps if we start with, with Charlotte. 
Hello, thank you, Carol. Um, and thank you for having me on the panel today. So I'm Charlotte Costello, sometimes known as Lottie Costello, um, and I am currently working in two, two roles. Um, so firstly, I'm the lead collaborative learning in practice or CLIP midwife at the Royal Berkshire Hospital, where my role is to support the implementation of coaching through the CLIP model. And I'm also working as part of the Bob ICS to support other organisations to implement coaching models as part of my role there as well. Thank you, Lottie. Emma, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Emma. Emma. Oh, sorry. Sorry, go on, Emma, you go first. Two Emmas. <laughs> Two Emmas. Um, I'm Emma. I'm a student midwife just coming to the end of my second year at Royal Barks. Emma, thank you. And uh, we have another Emma. <laughs> Um, thanks, Carol. Yeah, my name's Emma. I am the PLF um, at Leeds Teaching Hospital Trust and I'm joined with um, Laura, who's our deputy home. Thank you. Yeah. Laura, are you there? You're muted, Laura. Yeah, I was just trying to um, move my mouse from one screen to another. Hi, good morning. I'm Laura Walton, Deputy Head of Midwifery and Nursing at Leeds Teaching Hospitals. Thank you for Thank having you. me. And thank you for joining us, Laura. And we've heard from um, Emma Cruz, um, our second year student. And um, Callum, are you there? Hello, hi, I'm Callum. I am uh, just started my second year at RBH, um, working alongside Emma and also Lottie as well. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you both so much for coming, our students. And um, uh, last but by no means least, Kate. Are you there, Kate Cook? Hi, yeah, my name's Kate. Um, I'm one of the midwifery practice educators at the Royal Berkshire Hospital. Um, so I work with um, both midwives and students on the, in all the inpatient areas. Thank you so much, Kate. Have I, have I missed anyone on the panel? I don't think I have. No, great. OK, so thank you all for coming. Now, um, Juliet and I have got two questions. Doesn't sound like many, but there's quite a few people on the panel. So we're going to um, ask our questions and um, it will be really for the panel members to uh, they're invited to respond from the perspective of their own role. So, for example, you know, if you're a student, don't worry about thinking about the larger organisation. Just tell us what it's like from your own perspective. So um, I'm going to hand over to um, and of course, you don't have to say anything at all if you don't want to. <laughs> but I think you've all got lots to offer. Um, so I'll hand over to Juliet with the first question. Thank you, Juliet. Thank you. So um, just to reiterate, panel members, this is um, from your own perspectives. Um, and whilst you don't have to say anything, we would really rather like it if you did. Um, so um, the, the first is what from your perspective have been the benefits of using a coaching model? So I'm more than happy to kick things off from my perspective. Thank you, so my pleasure. So my perspective follows more what we've sort of discovered um, and worked through from the webinar today from that wider organisation and looking at the future workforce and the benefits for for that perspective. Um, so it's been brought up quite frequently that confidence is a really key aspect to utilising coaching um, in practice. And what we're starting to see, so from the RBH, we implemented um, our coaching models from June of 2022. And now we have our cohort of students that have just qualified as um, newly qualified midwives in their preceptorship period. And um, one of the biggest um, bonuses really of using a coaching model is that transition from being um, a student to being a newly qualified midwife when you're a student and you're having sort of being put at the front of care you're going through your care planning you're really becoming more aware of what the real role of a midwife looks like rather than being sheltered from it that naturally aids the transition into the preceptorship period because you've got all of that knowledge that you've developed so it's making that transition much smoother and from the workforce we're hoping that just that simple um, change in confidence can help our um, midwives to stay to stay to put, sort through that that period and we know with the repair projects and how we are losing staff if that confidence and just from coming from a coaching model can make that difference to retaining our staff in the newly qualified period then that's that's a real bonus thank you very much lottie anybody else from the panel like to share the successes of a coaching model from their perspective yeah i can jump in um jump in here so i've had Thanks, the benefit Carol. of working um, in the coaching model in both year one 
as a um, first year and then now year two so being a more senior student um, and I have really found it beneficial to have that familiar face of a student when you first go into the ward um, they know they've experienced it before they know um, the runnings of the the war they know the runnings and also the university side of it so having that familiar character there and person there to go to 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 support you in that sense has been really beneficial and then being that senior student side how you were treated in the first year in the good ways you can pass it on you to the second um to the senior students and junior students sorry um it's really helps you shape yourself and how you want to you want to be and the midwife you want to become um and so i really find it beneficial yeah with the confidence that's a current theme that um, that comes up is having being confident and pushing yourself out and having that support network there to to keep pushing you and keep driving you to who you are meant to be so i really find that side beneficial Thank you very much, Callum. And we'll invite Laura in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I think just to agree with what Callum and what Lottie have said, so, so important. I think it's also that sense of belonging as well. Um, and that like having that familiar face is so important to help with um with developing confidence we are a large large trust here in Leeds so it can be quite daunting um particularly for students coming into a new area so having that familiar face and somebody that they know within that area is absolutely key I think there was such our student particularly through the pandemic it's been really difficult for them to develop that peer support and those relationships and this model really really helps that and like I say gives that um that sense of belonging I'll let Emma come in thank you very much Emma thanks Lara um yeah I, I mean I agree with everything that everybody's already said as well so we've been running this um over the past year on the um ward and we have trialed it in community um I do think that both the the first and the third year students that we've run it with do see that confidence the first years um feel more confident in speaking to the third years and as they say asking those stupid questions that they might not approach the um the staff with um and also that they understand how it is to be a student they understand the pressures um you know in in terms of the pressures on placement the pressures at university they can help support them with their documentation as well um and also we've not got any service users on here at the moment um on this panel have we but i think um you know when we've spoken to them about how they've found it they've thought that they've had more people to care for them so they feel that there is a benefit and that they're more able to provide um continuing feedback to more people to to guide the students and help them with their learning um and i suppose finally from the staff's perspective and um, particularly on the wards initially it was like oh I've already got too much on if you're giving me more, even more students it's more difficult but actually once we got it up and running they saw the benefits of that and actually felt that they had more time because the students supported each other and they was kind of overseeing that indirectly they felt that they had more time to support the students with their learning um, and provide them with feedback etc. Thank you Emma lovely to hear the um, other perspectives you're able to to bring in there uh, so if we could come to Kate and then to our other Emma. Hi, um, I don't disagree with anything that's been said. Um, I just want to also bring in the fact that it encourages a holistic physiological approach to both mother and neonate. Um, so often when students are working with a midwife, um, you know, they will be observing and perhaps doing one or other of the checks or one or other of the care plans. But when they are in the coaching model, they do everything, uh, which means that they look at the, the, the you know, that biome of, of birthing person and baby together. Uh, they're interrelating the care planning within with both those individuals, um, which just encourages them to kind of look from a holistic point of view. Um, rather than having a more fragmented point of view, which the more traditional training sometimes offers. Oh, sorry, put myself on mute then. Uh, thank you very much, Kate. Um, and if we can could come to Emma. Yeah, um, bouncing off what Kate said, it's really nice to see the overall picture of all the care as well. 
and you can work with your peers and kind of split up a bit of the workload but then you're still discussing it together and working out what's next for the, your patients and um, which helps you develop that critical thinking as well because you're not just thinking about what you're doing in the moment but what this means for their care um, and then just sort of going to your midwife and seeing if there's anything else that needs to be done rather than being told and um, telling them what you've done and just explaining what um, you think needs to be done for their care as well um, and it just helps you develop that thinking a little bit more instead of just doing what you're told and then documenting it. Fabulous thank you I can see that um, that Sherry has um, a hand raised um, just Sherry this is an um, expert panel discussion um, so we're doing open question and answers a bit later later on so I just wanted to, to um, just in case you haven't seen the agenda, we'll pick up other questions um, further further down the line. Thank you. Um, Lottie. Thank you, Julia. Um, just to follow up really, like um, Emma Weatherhead was talking about the service user perspective. Um, and as part of this implementing the CLIP model, we did utilise questionnaires to try and gain that feedback um, from almost being on the other side of the coaching model. And it's very similar to what Emma had said in that the feedback we got was that our women and service users, they really liked hearing the coaching that would happen if you were using a multi-student model. So having two students in that room discussing the checks that they're doing on the baby, actually they're gaining more insight and that sort of evidence base behind the care they're receiving and in on a normal midwife's um, case load, they probably haven't got the time to facilitate that discussion just because of the clinical pressures. So actually having the students that it's beneficial for them, for their learning, but also for our um, women and birthing people, then that's a, a real positive and that has come up repeatedly. Uh, and there was a worry of, and it, it does get passed around occasionally, of how will um, our families feel with having more people in their space when it's that time it's a stressful time having a baby. Actually, it has been the opposite. And it's that feeling like they've got a little team that is there for them for that shift, that they will see these friendly faces that will come in and answer their call bells as part of their caseload for that day. And so that has been really positive. And off the back of that, we've had lots of families taking that time post having a baby several weeks later. They're remembering those student midwives that made such an impact in their, in their care. And that's a boost both for our students and for the supervisors caring for them and for the family. So it is a real win in that situation. Lovely. Thank you very much, Lottie. So I, I think we've um, we've heard from um, all the panel members there for, for the question that, that I um, positioned. So I'm going to hand over to Carol for um, as the ongoing double act. OK, lovely. Um, OK, so we've had some great feedback about the benefits or, su uh, or successes of using a coaching model. My question to the panel is, what would you say are the challenges or blockers to implementing a coaching model and how might they be addressed? Emma. I'll say Blatty. She went first last time, so I'll go first this time. Um, I think initially um, some of those challenges are getting the um, staff on board with what you want to do. Um, I think particularly because of the changes of triple SA, um, you know, the way that we're supporting students and practice has changed and obviously COVID kind of had a massive impact on us getting that up and running effectively. So there's been lots of changes within our trust just over the last sort of 12 to 18 months, getting everything up and running as it, as it should be. Um, and then we're now saying, OK, and on top of that, now we're going to be doing this as well. So um, for some staff, it does increase their anxiety. Um, it's about supporting them through it, explaining um, how the you know, the model should work that you're choosing to implement um, and obviously explaining the benefits of it to them. And once you've got one area up and running and, and it works well and they can see the results, then they are more likely to get on board. Um, I think we did trial it in community over the summer and that was definitely more challenging than the wards for numbers of reasons um, and definitely needs more um, work. But one of the things we've looked at is um, I think Jackie mentioned earlier around in community having if you've got clinics where they can have more than one room. Um, so we did do some booking clinics where there was um, obviously the midwife. There were two midwives actually on on the day and then there were sort of four rooms with students in each sort of undertaking those bookings and, you know, bobbing in and out with the supervision as and when they needed it. Um, and that did work really well. So that's something that we'll look at um, moving forward. Um, and finally, I think the other challenge was feedback. Um, and who they're getting feedback from, how they're getting it and planning and some of the students feeling like, as they put it, 
they weren't as important. So some of the first years felt that the third years were the priority um, in the model and not them. Um, but that took, just took some collaboration with um, us and the university and um, we jointly prepared um, a package for the students to explain to them how this model should work um, and we made some um, sort of a paper form which they can then upload to Pebblepad that where they can make their plans for the day in terms of their individual outcomes um, not the plans for the women um, and then how they will meet them whilst caring for the women and then give each other feedback and practice supervisor feedback and that has um, improved that process and made them all feel a bit more comfortable with it as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Emma. So let's hear from Laura and then from who's next? Was it Emma or Callum? Callum and then Emma. Let's go to Laura first, please. Thank you, Carol. No, just to reiterate really what Emma said, I think any change is always challenging. Everybody's so, so busy and thinking of doing something differently. It's always the impact on how will it make them busier? Will they have time to do it? They can't do it. How can they do things differently? But I think having somebody driving that change, Emma has been absolutely amazing. She has been driving that and providing that ongoing support as well for the teams. Um, any teething trouble, which there always is, isn't there? There's always little challenges. Um, so, yeah, so just having somebody driving that is a is a real, real, it's crucial, really. Um, and then I think just touching on community, it's it's the estate, really, and it's maybe thinking differently. Um, so, yes, yeah, some of the feedback that we'd received was that it wasn't um, fair for the women because there was a lot of students in within like a small area, lots of people. So it's just it's thinking of how can we work this differently, thinking outside of the box. Um, we are piloting some group antenatal sessions as well um, within Leeds in the new year. So, again, that's a good way to be able to get this model into the community because again we'll have a larger room there'll be more people it's a different way of working um, and then reaping the benefits really from having this model out in community lovely laura thank you let's go to emma c now you've been patiently waiting i think from a student's um, perspective it's really dependent on the placement area you're in for example like the postnatal ward it's quite easy to work together and get your proficiencies achieved and everything. But um, when I worked on the assessment unit, I thought it was really tricky to get them signed. And um, there weren't as many opportunities for both of us to have input into the same women's care. And it meant kind of taking turns and we could still ask each other questions and bounce off each other. But in terms of providing the care, we found ourselves taking turn, which meant one of us was missing out on stuff and I did leave the shift kind of with not as much signed as I needed for that day or could have um, and yeah I was the junior student in that shift and I did find that a lot of focus went on the third year's learning needs and there wasn't much discussion on what I needed um, and yeah I think that is difficult because then you finish a placement area and you haven't got as much um, as you needed to achieve did did you um Emma did you did you raise that with your um practice supervisor I've had a um a discussion with one of our clinical placement facilitators um and she said she'd look into that as well thank you so much for sharing that Callum let's come to you Hi, uh, yes. So just even following from Emma as a from a student's perspective especially being one of the some of the um junior um junior um, students in the role. Proficiencies is something that we go into with a list <laughs> at this very start. We we go on to shift thinking we want to get this done, this done, this done where it can come up. And being in that clip model, um, some students may feel that not having that direct supervision, they think how can the midwife then sign off from that um, proficiency? Um, and especially in year one where it's only um, con like participating. So um, you're not necessarily providing all, that, all the care, but it's participating. So um, it's just their confidence in in getting the proficiency signed, and the um, and the midwife, the the qualified midwives themselves also feeling comfortable and satisfied that that student has provided that proficiency. Um, but what I found is that sitting down with the midwife at the start and at the end of the shift, recapping what has happened during the shift. 
um, and even touch and base throughout the throughout the day really help to build that rapport with that midwife that you might not see throughout every day, every second of every um, shift. But it also gives them a good stead on where you are with your proficiencies as well as your confidence as well. So um, that's the sort of area with proficiencies that some students feel. Thank you. And Lottie, you would like to respond, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. So leading on from Callum, I think that's the beauty of the flexibility of coaching approaches and what you choose in practice. So implementing a coaching approach doesn't mean that you can forget those more traditional elements of supporting a student, because it may absolutely be that you do need to work in a little bit more closely with, for example, the junior or possibly the senior student to help them facilitate the proficiencies that they need to get signed. Or if they're just having a day where they just have a wobble of confidence and they just want to work a little bit closer. And just because you're using the clip model or a coaching approach doesn't mean that that still can't happen um, and leading on to Emma so that's part of our trial in the day assessment unit um, and like anything those trial periods where it's been extremely busy um, as a service and that what we can do is we need to go back and look at how we can support because that's the the nature of when you're implementing that change in the early stages what are those teething problems and like Callum said where are the opportunities possibly the clip midwife or a um, clinical facilitator coming to um, enable them to have 10-15 minutes with their supervisor at a point in the day and um, we we're also thinking about introducing possible huddles so a huddle chance for a supervisor and students to come together to specifically look at their book with dedicated time because even in traditional models we know that proficiencies and managing the time to get them signed is difficult whether you're working with two students or just the one and so it's looking from that management side at how can we support both our supervisors and the students so that they're getting the benefits of the coaching model and trying to iron out some of those problems. Thank you Lottie and just keeping an eye on the time I know the time is running away and um, I just come to Kate to see if you wanted to add anything Kate before we um, wind up this discussion. Um, I think the only thing I would say is just from the point of view of the person offering the coaching is obviously the acuity on the ward uh, makes a big difference and it's important I think for staff to recognise that uh, coaching takes time um, and it's important as Lottie has said to for there to be a way in which uh, time is managed so that the people offering the coaching aren't always working over their shift hours um, because they've then got a lot of documentation to catch up on at the end of the shift um, so acuity I think is probably the biggest barrier uh, to great coaching. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I really loved the way I, th I thought I had the hardest question to ask, actually, but it wasn't that hard because, you know, you came up with your solutions to the challenges. And I think this is what this illustrates, that um, when you're using a coaching model, one has to be flexible and adaptable. And for me, you really know your service so well. So, for example, you can anticipate what the problems are and you can find your own solutions to still make it work. I love the way that you, um, came, you know, that came across. So um, on behalf of Juliet and myself, I'd like to thank our wonderful panel members. They, some of them hadn't met before, but they were like so joined up. You know, thank you all so much. So um, I'm going to hand back over to Ricky, just aware of the time. It's it's quarter past 11 nearly. And we've got um, an open session now, I believe. Yes, thank you so much to all of you from the expert panel. Um, that was really, really great. Um, yeah, we're running slightly behind time, but that's fine. We've now got our interactive Q&A. Um, we welcome anyone with any comments, questions, queries to put their hands up and we will go around the room and we will hopefully answer your questions, have discussions. And we're also looking at the um, at the chat um, and Jackie, your hands up first. Thank you. Ricky, can we just stop the recording just in case anybody is not comfortable to ask a question on camera? We're, we're going to stop. Oh, the recording. Thank you so now. much. Uh, that was in the highlights on my agenda and I forgot. So thank you so much. And um, I'll pass over to Caroline for her closing comments. OK, thanks, Ricky. It's been such a pleasure to listen to the wealth of information from the panel today and to all of the great contributions from the guests. 
And thank you for accommodating me to collaborate with you on this. It's been fantastic. Um, so you've heard us discuss lots of models such as CLIP and SLIC today, and there are other models in use across the country. But a coaching approach can be used without any of the other aspects of these models, such as the collaborative learning or the education hour. We've heard from Lisa earlier that the national team is working on a toolkit to support coaching. However, as our experts have described, if you work in an area that's still employing the traditional one practice supervisor to one student model, you can still use a coaching approach to facilitate learning with that student. So you can do things like encouraging the learners to identify their own learning objectives at the beginning of a shift, allowing them to self appraise during discussions of feedback, encouraging the learners to provide holistic care rather than allocating them just tasks when possible. And therefore, when you consider their level of confidence and skills, you may be able to allow them to take the responsibility for the care of a group of service users. Of course, while you're all, always remain, they're always remaining supernumerary under your supervision and using a coaching style for any conversation. So you could use a grow model or similar. Um, I'll hand back over to you then, Ricky, um, to say thanks. Thanks so much, Caroline, and thank you to everyone for coming today.